Dear colleagues, welcome to the ESL studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast news. The today's uh, live episode is titled, is the term decompensated cirrhosis outdated? And uh, it's linked uh, not to a perspective study, not to a randomized controlled clinical study, but to an expert opinion that we published last year on the journal. The authors are Gennaro D'Amico, Mauro Bernardi, and myself. Which is the rationale of this episode? During the last 10 years, we have introduced new definition of decompensation. Not only decompensation per se, but acute decompensation, further decompensation, acute on chronic liver failure. So the senior editors of the journal and I think that it is the right time to reflect, to deepen this issue, laying the basis if possible to develop a path in order to get a global consensus on definition, on terminology. And to start this path, I will chair today this round table to which uh, three great experts were invited. Professor Guadalupe Garcia Sal from US, Professor Thomas Reinberger from Austria, and Professor Salvatore Piano from Italy. And first of all, let me thank all the participants for uh, having accepted our invitation. So I want to start with a very simple question, this round table. Do you think that the term decompensated cirrhosis is uh, outdated? And which is your current idea, definition of decompensation? Please. Professor Tsao. So thank you so much, Paolo, for inviting me to participate in this. And, and I do not think that the term decomposition is outdated. It tells us a very specific point in the natural history of cirrhosis. It's, it's actually a, a, a game-changing turning point where the patient has no complications of cirrhosis versus a patient who now develops complications of cirrhosis. And traditionally, and the way, uh, you know, Gennaro and his studies have mentioned that the composite events that are clear are ascites, are variceal hemorrhage, are hepatic encephalopathy. And yes, jaundice is a decompensated event. And the, the question is whether we should consider it a, deco a, a decompensating event alone as a first decompensated event, which is not that common, or is it in, an indication of something that is that makes the patient sicker, as if, so what we call further decompensation. So, Thomas, uh, and, yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, that's Please okay. Gone. No, no, no. I don't want to take Thomas, away. What do you think? Also, thank you for inviting me to this ESO studio. Uh, you know, uh, cirrhosis and decompensation is very close to my heart. And uh, we have all working in this area, and uh, it is an old problem, but not outdated, um, as you as you have asked. It's still a very very significant event. And uh, for me, um, if you think about a definition of a of a condition, it should be clinically relevant in terms of prognosis or in terms of treatment. And so both of uh, both of these aspects are clearly uh, affected by decompensation. And uh, traditionally, as Lupe said, I think it's clearly a, acute pericial bleeding, ascites and hepatic encephalopathy and jaundice. But if first further uh, decompensation needs to be further discriminated, uh, then I would vote that jaundice goes more on the end of the spectrum, but clearly not outdated, very relevant. Let's discuss more. <laughs> Thank you. And you, Salvatore. So hello everybody and thank you for uh, inviting me to this session. While well, I also think that uh, the competitive cirrhosis is not outdated, still nowadays uh, we treat our patients and our guidelines are based on compensated and decompensated cirrhosis. And uh, in preparation for the episode, I just was looking on PubMed uh, decompensated cirrhosis and in the last year, 800 paper were published on this topic. Therefore, it is not outdated. 
<laughs> Moving to, to the definition, uh, yeah, I also agree with Lupa and Thomas, the compensation should be a direct consequence of the disease, should be associated with the worst prognosis, and should be easy to diagnose. And in this sense, ascites, variceal bleeding, and hepatic encephalopathy certainly meet the criteria of decompensation. And for Jandis, I also agree that this, it is rare as a first episode and is more qualifying a patient with a further decompensation or an acute decompensation. Thank you. Do you think that uh, sarcopenia should be included in the definition of uh, decompensation or father decompensation in patients with cirrhosis? Because the sarcopenia has a deep negative impact on survival. So do you want me to answer? So, so sarcopenia, yeah. I think it clearly has been, you know, related to a poor mortality, which is what we're talking about. But I think it's sort of in the same compartment as jaundice. It's usually in a sicker patient. The compensated patient is the patient that, that barely has sarcopenia. So I am not sure about, about that. I think that it, it that, I mean, in a way, for example, albumin levels will correlate with sarcopenia. I'm not entirely sure that sarcopenia belongs as the first decompensating event because it's not clearly a decompensation that's related to cirrhosis per se. I mean, ascites has to do with the liver, you know, variceal hemorrhage for sure, encephalopathy for sure, and even jaundice has to do with liver insufficiency. Sarcopenia is sort of like a secondary complication that is clearly a bad thing, but I don't think should be long as a definition of decompensation. We will follow the same order. So, Thomas. Yeah. Um, there is not, nothing, uh, not much to add from this side. I would also see sarcopenia as a relevant condition but it is more of an associated condition. And, you know, and sarcopenia occurs also in other severe uh, diseases and, and conditions. So that's why I would not say it's cirrhosis specific. It's common in cirrhosis. It needs to be assessed when you know, developing uh, prognostic models. It is usually uh, even going into prognostic scores like the ECOG performance scores and so on. But it is for me not a typical uh, condition to be included in the definition of decompensation. Yeah, so this is the first agreement we have. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> let me move now to the, to the main question, because uh, in the expert opinion I mentioned, uh, and I ask uh, for the first slide, the main content is summarized by this figure, the authors, hypothesized two different patterns of decompensation, acute decompensation and non-acute decompensation. So I want to know your opinion on this. Lupe. So you want me to go? So yeah. my, my opinion is that the acute, the, the acuity or not is something that is, that, that, that is inherent to the complication itself. For example, bleeding is acute almost by definition. The patient vomits blood, it's an acute event, all right? Encephalopathy could be chronic, could also be acute, especially if the patient presents with pre-coma or a coma. Ascites is the one that I struggle the most with because by definition, ascites is a chronic event. And it's and it based it and, and it, it the patient may notice it, and which I'm just on service right now, and, and the patient. You can see in their CAT scan, they were developing some ascites, but they don't present until their belly is big. Is that acute? No, it's been accumulating for several months. So I cannot reconcile that one calls it acute. And especially if you're gonna consider hospitalization within the definition, then it, it's not only the patient, but it's also the provider. And a patient with ascites, you know, may decide to go to their primary doctor and not be hospitalized, or made this, or made it to come in in the hospital. It's, it's based on the patient, the provider, not in the entity itself. Uh, what was the next question? That, that that I think that I have an issue with with defining acute onset, and maybe we need to define it better. Not taking away the the, the hospitalization and taking away, um, you know, we have to figure out what 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 is what what is what. We, once we diagnose acute onset, what are our expectations? What do we want to prevent or what do we want to work on? And for example, in acute onset, you have sepsis there. 
sepsis, you know, it, it, you know, if you look at the ACLF, okay. that's just Thomas. any infection. Thomas. You know, you see that's, um, um, in, that is a problem in this, with the in this regard, Thomas. when I look at the, the, um, the figure, uh, what's proposed here, um, I think the, uh, there is no question that bleeding, ascites, encephalopathy, uh, and jaundice is a decompensation event. But on the other hand, um, I'm not so sure if we need to really discriminate between acute and non-acute or progressive, uh, because all these decompensation events can go from mild to severe. And uh, many of them, except for acute variceal bleeding, it's, it's actually in the term itself, can, can actually occur quickly or they might occur in a delayed fashion. So I'm not sure if this needs to be defined. I'm, I'm very sure that we should be very specific what is decompensation and then look into the prognostic factors within these types of decompensation. A typical uh, spectrum for me would be mild hepatic encephalopathy that can be very transient, might just go away, might be triggered by a mild infection. And on the other hand, you have very, very severe jaundice with a bilirubin of 25 or so. So this is, I think, uh, within the different types of prognostic uh, decompensation, we need to find uh, prognostic factors, but I'm not sure if acute or non-acute is, is the most important discriminative factor here. Salvatore, what do you think? Uh, so what, what I think is that certainly this uh, a new type of decompensation is try to define the decompensation according to the acuity. And I think it, this is uh, important also to try uh, to merge the finding from the EFP study, canonic study and predict study, and the finding from Marino that is more uh, correlated to the timing of the events. Because, uh, you know, uh, from um, the clinical ground, we know that uh, I agree that ascites is not uh, something immediate, but uh, we all experience patients that in few days uh, develop tense ascites uh, and therefore they require hospitalization while there are other patients that develop ascites after several days. And usually in the first case, there is a precipitating event. This patient should be hospitalized and we should look for precipitating events, namely uh, bacterial infections. On the other end, some other patients can be managed in the outpatient clinic. What I think it is uh, a potential weakness is how we define acuity that is the need for hospitalization, because this may depend on the, on the, the healthcare system. But uh, in the, on the other end, if we can find a way to better characterize the acuity according to the pathophysiology, according to the precipitating events, this may really help us to define different pathways and also different way we can manage these patients. I can, the non-acute compensated patients can be managed in the outpatient clinic just with simple measure, while for the other patients, we need to look for organ failures, to look for precipitants, and therefore they should be hospitalized. Therefore, I think that this uh, working hypothesis on which uh, we should try to uh, find uh, an agreement and that should be better characterized. Fully agree. Of course, uh, this hypothesis makes sense if we prove that the prognosis in patients with acute compensation is different than in patients with non-acute decompensation. Absolutely. Absolutely, and that doing so, something will prevent them from. Do you see what I'm saying? It, it has to come not only with a prognosis, but in our, are we going to do something different than in the other group? Yeah, but let me say that acute decompensation was proved to identify a cohort of patients that then develop acute and chronic liver failure. You know, with a very high mortality rate at 28 days. So. It is quite important uh, to define uh, in a better way acute decompensation. And the criteria may be the type of decompensating event, the severity of decompensating event, 
the need of emergent hospitalization, but there are some biases on this. And I think in the era of a personalized precision medicine, a better definition of the pathophysiological background based on big data, on omic data, for example. What do you think? So can I just make a little, uh, in, in terms of, of, of predicting ACLF, and I agree that, but in the canonic study, only 30% really develop ACLF. So, yeah. so one would have to, you know, make that criteria a little more strict so that we're really identifying patients that are going to go with this. And, and, and in order to do this, yes, we may use omics, we may use, but I think clinical and, and other parameters would be useful to try to give us a higher percentage than that and, and, and really identify those patients that have other says, okay, this patient has to come in the hospital because we are going to like really uh, work on this patient. And it has nothing to do with a clinician, maybe something that is not clinician based. Thomas, do you want to add something, Salvatore? I want to agree uh, very much on this, um, on including um, the requirement of hospitalization, because this very much depends on the resources and the setting. Um, and so this, this might be problematic. I mean, in most, most settings, uh, I would think that acute variceal bleeding must be admitted uh, if, if this is not really limited uh, setting. But then there are patients who have uh, very severe ascites. They might go under uh, paracentesis in an outpatient setting. Uh, and this patient is indeed also at risk for um, yeah. developing hepatorenal syndrome and later on ACLF. Um, and, and also, for example, jaundice again, uh, you know, the uh, jaundice was here listed uh, under uh, non-acute decompensation or progressive decompensation, but it's actually a very typical scenario where you experience ACLF. So, you know, the, and the course, if you follow the, the, the graph would actually suggest that, that, that jaundice is more uh, in the non-acute setting and then it goes there. Um, but, but again, I would like to stress that each of these decompensation vary, uh, can vary in their severity. So a, a patient with child acerosis developing acute variceal bleeding can very well recover. A patient uh, even with, uh, with, let's say, grade two ascites after biological cure can recompensate. And, and, and so it's, it's within each decompensation, there, has, there is a range of disease severity. And I think that needs to be captured and that could be captured in a prospective study, um, you know, coming really to the, to the most important discriminators, which is, uh, you know, short-term mortality, risk of extra hepatic and hepatic organ failure, and that can be defined in a prospective setting. Salvatore? If I can add on that, in, uh, I, I fully agree uh, with, with this point and, I think that this kind of study should also try uh, to, to characterize you know, these different types of decompensation in terms of acuity based, in, based on uh, samples, uh, uh, different you know, uh, characteristics uh, such as uh, that uh, are important for the pathophysiology, such as uh, the inflammation, the um, circulatory dysfunction, markers of portal hypertension, and so on. And this uh, really will be important to better understand this uh, heterogeneous and complex disease. Okay, let me go on. Speaking about acute uh, decompensation, because uh, it has been proved that in one four, one third of the cases, it is uh, the first decompensating event. So it occurs in patients with compensate cirrhosis. But in the majority of patients, it occurs as father decompensation. Correct. So do you think in an attempt to harmonize the definition that we can consider in the majority of the cases, acute decompensation under the umbrella of father decompensation? Uh, I fully agree with that, actually. Is, you know, 75% of these patients had some other decompensating event before they developed this acute decompensation. So I do think that 
in the this one is in the under the umbrella of further decomposition. These are pieces that are much thicker. They just do not belong to just pure decomposition. They are further decomposition. Thomas Salvatore, do you I'm agree? A, I, um, I have to say I'm 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 not fully decided yet. Huh? Um, I would think that uh, this is mostly uh, occurring. That acute decompensation is mostly occurring as further decompensation. Um, but again, for for example, acute peristeal bleeding can be the first event. It can lead to hospitalization. But it, uh, you know, there are also very, a, there was an important uh, change in the efficacy of treatment, and uh, and we have seen decreasing mortality rate. So that's why again, um, new data, considering the the advances that we made with treatment and also with uh, with management, uh, is uh, is has to be considered. Um, but uh, overall, I would also think that acute decompensation that that requires hospitalization is again in the in the severe end of the spectrum and mostly further, but there are also exceptions. Okay. So yeah, I also I also so agree that uh, in the acute decompensated patients, uh, frequently almost eighty percent uh, are uh, have a further decompensation. I already had a previous decompensation before, and uh, this is uh, certainly true. Uh, what is uh, in, also important to be highlighted is that uh, in the case the patients develop the first decompensation as an acute decompensation and there's also ACLF, you should be very worried because uh, these patients, in spite of having a first decompensation, are at increased risk of mortality. And uh, the canonics data proved that uh, therefore, it highlighted the importance of uh, acuity of the events and uh, also as the first uh, decompensation. So there may be exceptions, I agree, but, but you know, in general, I would say that when we think of these patients, we should think of, of, of having, so you have not only complications of portal hypertension, but you're not having liver insufficient, you have more inflammation, you have something else that makes these people sicker. Maybe, yes, in the very composite way, maybe there's something there that will predict who, who within this composite, small group of composite patients may develop this so-called acute decompensation. Great. So yeah, we need studies to look at this for sure. Okay. Now, a very difficult question. I have not a clear answer. Uh -oh. So in a patient with decompensated cirrhosis, should bacterial infection or some bacterial infection included in the definition of acute decompensation or further decompensation, or should the bacterial infection be considered always as precipitating events? Uh I feel very, <laughs> I feel that they're precipitating events. In fact, in Baveno, we put SVP as definition for the conversation, and I have issues with that. I think that infections are incredibly important. They're, they're, but they are something that 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 the patient would become cirrhosis is more likely to have, but that will also lead to this acute decompensation. I think this is, I think this is my personal opinion that infections should be separate. Thomas, I don't like what the other people think. Thomas Salvatore. For me, uh, infections are, are mostly uh, events that trigger uh, decompensation. But I have to say, um, infections may also occur in compensated patients. Um, and um, for me, uh, I think there are two aspects relating to this aspect. The um, infections are more frequent in already decompensated patients. For example, with ascites, there's more bacterial translocation. Um, but the ST may also occur again in, in compensated patients as well. Um, I might think that this should not be uh, defining further or first decompensation. And so I would rather consider them as a trigger and not to include them in the definition. Yeah, I also agree that uh, that infection are a precipitating event, not a, a money, not a, um, decompensation, because first of all, they are not a direct consequence of the disease. So, although we know 
the patient with decompensated cirrhosis may have uh, immune dysfunction, increasing intestinal permeability, and therefore are predisposed to develop infection. Infections per se uh, can uh, be a, just a manifestation of uh, the contact of the patients with uh, a pathogen, you know, such as a pneumonia in an healthy subject with respiratory failure and in a patient with decompensated cirrhosis with respiratory failure is pneumonia. The only difference is that those with decompensated cirrhosis have a high mortality. Uh, the, only potential, uh, uh, the only potential infection that can be considered is SBP to me, uh, just because uh, this is very specific of cirrhosis. This is uh, really a consequence of the pathophysiology, you know, with the bacterial translocation and this going ascites. Therefore, uh, probably the only exception to me is uh, SBP. For other infection, uh, just precipitating event. Yeah, I, I struggle with that actually. Yeah. I... <laughs> you too, Thomas. You agree that SBP should be considered the father decompensation? I'm not I'm compensating not... event. I, I would agree um, because it's also cirrhosis specific. If you, for example, look at um, uh, nephrogenic ascites or ascites occurring in uh, patients with uh, uh, severe cardiomyopathy, decompensated heart failure, uh, they rarely develop infection of their acidic fluid. And uh, this is also, again, uh, due to pathophysiological concept of translocation. So I would, I would rather be uh, on the side to include it in the definition of further decompensation. Great, another agreement, eh? small agreement, but agreement, that oh, is well, great. Not entirely. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we speak about decompensation, we should speak about recompensation. So, what is your idea? We, I, I, I don't love think we can give a definition now, but what is your idea about recompensation? Well, recompensation occurs for sure. And we have yeah. seen this with alcohol from way back. We have seen it with, now with hepatitis C. The patient that's decompensated and even further decompensated, that comes back to an entirely compensated stage. And this has to do, it has to do necessarily with treatment of etiology, uh, with resolution of the etiologic agent. And it, and I love to see this, you know, to me, that is the, I mean, I have a patient that I saw 30 some years ago who had ascites, SBP, jaundice, outcap, and is now entirely compensated. It's, 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 it's wonderful to see this happen, but we know it happens. And that's what gives us the impetus to get at the etiologic therapy of these patients. So removal of etiology is crucial for the definition. Uh, what else? What else? Oh, well, disappearance, like, uh, disappearance of complications. Well, Perbabeno disappears, but not only yeah. that, now they have to return to a normal liver synthetic function. So the albumin has to be more, you know, they have to, without, they have to be off diuretics, have aside, have no ascites, but without the use of diuretics. Some people say, oh, he's recompensated because we are giving him diuretics. That's not recompensation. The ascite has to go away, no need for diuretics. The issue that is still tenuous is, is varices varis and varicell hemorrhage, we cannot see them clinically. Encephalopathy without refractive or lactose, they were free of encephalopathy. Those two are clinically accessible very easily. So you're, and the liver synthetic function has to be normal. And, and so, so those are the criteria that would define really uh, someone who has recompensated. Let me be a little bit provocative. Okay. Should we remove also beta blockers? Yeah, well, that's that's what I said. That's the whole thing. We still don't know. I mean, now with liver stiffness and so forth, yes, we have to come to the point where if you reach a certain liver stiffness and the platelet count go up, we can remove the beta block. So I think we will get to the point where we can refine the criteria when we're sure this patient will not have complications from varices or variceal hemorrhage. Thomas, what is your idea on recompensation? You know, Lupe and me were in the same panel in Bavino, know. when we defined <laughs> recompensation, so it's mostly uh, very similar. Um, and uh, the removal of the etiological factor is, is key, yeah? and the improvement in synthetic function is key. Um, and then um, there is the, the, the question that you had, is it, should all these patients have the beta blocker removed? Uh, and I would say no. 
uh, because compensated patients can have clinically significant portal hypertension. Recompensated patients can also still have clinically significant portal hypertension. And while this is still um, an, uh, a belief and not a proven fact, but we still believe that as long as clinically significant portal hypertension is there, the beta blocker uh, is effective for the patients. So that means within this subset of recompensated patients that still suffer from CSPH, I would not give the beta blocker away, but they can be clinically achieve the label of recompensation. Salvatore. Oh, well, so I also was in the same panel before. Uh, it oh, is, right. it, is hard. <laughs> it no, is hard to- I made and, uh, the right but, choice. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but I can tell, so I fully agree with the treatment of etiology that should be cured, the um, disappearance of uh, signs of decompensation and improvement of liver function. Uh, I, I have to say that sometimes the decision to uh, suspend to withdraw diuretics or to withdraw lactulose is very much based on uh, physician perfect perspectives and also, you know, uh, the patient is going well uh, without ascites with low dose diuretics. I'm just seeing the patients every six months uh, with uh, ultrasound for HCC screening. Right. Should I withdraw? the treatment, uh, uh, but uh, see the patients uh, the, the following weeks just to be sure that uh, he's not uh, having uh, ascites again. Therefore, I think on this point, uh, probably uh, this can be refined. And uh, I have also to say that this is uh, you know, an expert opinion definition, and we still don't know how common it, uh, recompensation of course when you remove the uh, the etiologic factor and if patients that got recompensation have actually a prognosis that is similar to those with compensated cirrhosis right. yeah. and i yeah. think this is uh, this is something of which uh, we should try to work in the next future uh, absolutely and, and yeah. but you know i think that i have no problem taking away diuretics because if the albumin is is more than 3.9 or th I know that I can take it. I have clothes that won't won't do it. I said, I don't know, we're we're discontinuing diuretics and, and it and it doesn't come back, you know. Yeah, but probably once the liver probably, synthetic function is normal. Yeah, probably we should also identify some clear point at which time we are confident that we I can hear, do that. No, no, there's no question that we need to study these issues. Yeah. So we are close to the end of the session. So I want to, to see the last slide we prepare because I want to, to ask you if uh, planning a large perspective international multi-center trial in patient with decompensated cirrhosis, a high risk to develop decompensation, may be the best way to move on on the path to get a consensus on terminology and on definitions. Cool. I want to know your opinion on this. I, I think this is definitely necessary. I mean, this is a, a new thing. We have to understand it better as everything, you know, in hepatology, that's what makes it so exciting. So if we can look at this prospectively and you're absolutely right with the multi-center thing where we have very clear definitions of who is going to be classified as what, and then we can look at the at the prognosis there, et cetera, and try and, and then further stratify uh, these patients with cirrhosis. Thomas? Yep. Absolutely. I would love to see that study. Um, mm -hmm. It would be uh, in a new area with different treatments uh, that has obviously impacted on the course and the natural history of these patients. So we need, we need to have this. Yeah? We cannot just rely on the old data. So these are outdated, but uh, decompensation is not outdated. So let's do it. Salvatore? Yeah, I also fully agree that uh, with, uh, with data, collaboration and science, uh, we can uh, really make a step forward in understanding of uh, decompensated cirrhosis and uh, uh, patterns of decompensation. So I will hope to have the cooperation across the consortia 
to to put on this study. Eh? I will push for this. You you can count on Baveno to participate in this and all the U.S. centers as well. Thank you very much. So we should close the session. I want to thank uh, the expert and all the attendees to this episode. And I will invite you to the next one next week. In the next one, we will bring you the base to the basics of artificial intelligence in hepatology. And please remember to become a member of our family and to join the ESO family. Thank you very much to everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.